Reuben Sachs, a sketch, by Amy Levi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reuben Sachs by Amy Levi, read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Fifteen. Wenn ich sein Brot mit Tränen aß, wenn ich die kommen wolle Nächte auf seinen Bett wie in Sass, der kennt euch nicht, ihr himmlische Mächte. Goethe There was a little set of shelves in Judith's bedroom which contained the whole of her modest library, some twenty books in all, Lorna Doon, Carlyle's Sterling, Macaulay's Essays, Hypatia, the life of Palmerston, and the life of Lord Beaconsfield. These were among her favourites, and they had all been given to her by Reuben Sachs. Like many wholly unliterary people, she preferred the mildly instructive, even in her fiction. It was a matter of surprise to her that clever creatures like Leo and Esther, for instance, should pass whole days, when the fit was on, in the perusal of such works as cometh up as a flower, and molly born. But it was not novels, even the less frivolous ones, that Judith cared for. Rose, whose literary tastes inclined towards the society papers, varied by an occasional French novel, had said of her, with some truth, that the drier a book was, the better she liked it. Reuben had long ago discovered Judith's power of following out a train of thought in her clear, careful way and had taken pleasure in providing her with historical essays and political lives, and even in leading her through the mazes of modern politics. Perhaps he did not realize what it is always hard for the happy, objective male creature to realize, that if he had happened to be a doctor, Judith might have developed scientific tastes, or if a clergyman, have found nothing so interesting as theological discussion and the history of the Church. Judith stood before her little library in the dark November dawn, with her candle in her hand, scanning the familiar titles with weary eyes. She was so young and strong that, even in her misery, she could sleep the greater part of the night. But these last few days she had taken to waking at dawn, to lying for hours wide-eyed in her little white bed, while the slow day grew. But to-day it was intolerable she could bear it no longer to lie and let the heavy, inarticulate sorrow prey on her. She would try a book. Not a very hopeful remedy, in her opinion, but one which Reuben, Esther, and Leo, who were all troubled by sleeplessness, regarded she knew as the best thing under the circumstances. So she scanned the familiar bookshelves, then turned away. There was nothing there to meet her case. She put on her dressing-gown and stole out softly across the passage to Leo's empty room, where she remembered to have seen some books. Here she set the candle down, and, as she looked round the dim walls, her thoughts went out suddenly to Leo himself, went out to him with a new tenderness, with something that was almost comprehension. She knew, though she did not use the word to herself, that after some blind, groping fashion of his own, Leo was an idealist. Poor Leo! There were books on a table near, and she took them up one by one. Some volumes of Heine, in prose and verse, the operatic score of Parsifal, Donaldson on the Greek theatre, and then two books of poetry, each of which, had she but known it, appealed strongly to two strongly marked phrases of Leo's mood, poems and ballads, and a worn green copy of the poems of Clough. She turned over the leaves carelessly. Poetry? Yes, yeah, she would try a little poetry. She had always enjoyed reading Tennyson and Shakespeare in the schoolroom, so she put the books under her arm, went back to her room, and crept into her little cold bed. She took up the volume of Swinburne, and began reading it mechanically by the flickering candlelight. The rolling, copious phrases conveyed little meaning to her, but she liked the music of them. There was something to make a sophisticated onlooker laugh in the sight of this young, 
pure creature, with her strong, slow-growing passions, her strong, slow-growing intellect, bending over the diffuse, unreserved, unrestrained pages. She came at last to one poem, The Triumph of Time, which seemed to have more meaning than the others, and which had rested her attention, though even this was only comprehensible at intervals. She read on and on. I have given no man of any fruit to eat. I have trod the grapes, I have drunken the wine. Had you eaten and drunken and found it sweet, this wild new growth of the corn and vine, this wine and bread without lees or leaven, we had grown as gods, as the gods in heaven, souls fair to look upon, goodly to greet, one splendid spirit, your soul and mine. In the change of years, in the coil of things, in the clamour and rumour of life to be, we, drinking love at the furthest springs, covered with love as a covering tree, we had grown as gods, as the gods above, filled from the heart to the lips with love, held fast in his arms, clothed warm in his wings, O oh, love, my love, had you loved but me! We had stood as the sure stars stand and moved, as the moon moves, loving the world, and seen grief collapse as a thing disapproved, death consume as a thing unclean, twin halves of a perfect heart made fast, soul to soul, while the years fell past. Had you loved me once, as you have not loved, had the chance been with us that has not been? The slow tears gathered in her eyes, and forcing themselves forward, fell down her cheeks. Then there was, after all, something to be said for feelings which had not their basis in material relationships. They were not mere phantasmagoria, conjured up by silly people, by sentimental people, by women. Clever men, men of distinction recognized them, treated them as of paramount importance. The practical, if not the theoretical, teaching of her life had been to treat as absurd any close or strong feeling which had not its foundations in material interests. There must be no undue giving away of oneself in friendship, in the pursuit of ideas, in charity, in a public cause. Only gushing fools did such a thing, and their folly generally met with its reward. And this teaching, sensible enough in its way, had been accepted without question by the clannish, exclusive, conservative soul of Judith. Where your interests lie, there should lie your duties, and where your duties your feelings. A wholesome doctrine, no doubt, if not one that will always meet the far-reaching and complicated needs of a human soul, and if this doctrine applied to friendship, to philanthropy, to art and politics, in how much greater a degree must it apply to love, to the unspoken, unacknowledged love between a man and woman? a thing in its very essence immaterial, and which, in its nature, can have no rights, no duties attached to it. It was the very hatred of the position into which she had been forced, the very loathing of what was so alien to her whole way of life and mode of thought, that was giving Judith courage. If she could not vindicate herself, she must be simply crushed beneath the load of shame. On one point, the nature and extent of her feeling for Reuben, there could no longer be illusion or self-deception. She would have walked to the stake for him without a murmur, and she knew it. She knew, too, that Reuben loved her, as far as in him lay, knew with a bitter humiliation how far short of hers fell his love. Yet. Deep in her heart lay the touching, obstinate belief of the woman who loves, that she was necessary to him, that she alone could minister to his needs, that in turning away from her and her large protection, her infinite toleration, he was turning away from the best which life had to offer him. In the first sharp agony of awakening, Judith, as we know, 
had recognized that which had grown up between her and Reuben as a reality with rights and claims of its own. And the conviction of this was slowly growing upon her in the intervals of the swinging back of the pendulum, when she judged herself by conventional standards, and felt herself withered by her own scorn, the scorn of her world, and the scorn of the man she loved. A great tear splashing down across the triumph of time recalled her to herself. She shut the book and sat up in bed, sweeping back the heavy masses of hair from her forehead. Often and often, with secret contempt and astonishment, had she seen Esther dissolved in tears over her favourite poets. Should she grow in time to be like Esther, undignified, unreserved? Would people talk about her, pity her, say that she had had unfortunate love affairs? Oh, yes, they would talk. That was the way of her world. Even Rose, who was kind, and her own mother, who loved her, no doubt they had begun to talk already. Then, with a sense of unutterable weariness, she fell back on the pillows and slept. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 What help is there? There is no help, for all these things are so. A. C. Swinburne "'Come over here, Judith, and I will show you something,' said Ernest Lunninger, as he sat by the fire in the morning-room. It was two days after Reuben's departure for St. Baldwin's, and Ernest had returned from the country that morning. She went over to him, drawing a chair close to his. Judith was always very kind to him, and he admired her immensely, treating her at intervals with a sort of gallantry. "'Now look at me!' He had the solitaire board on his knee, and a little glass ball with coloured threads spun into it between his fingers. There, and there, and there! Judith bent forward dutifully, watching how he lifted the marbles one after the other from their holes. Don't you see? He looked at her triumphantly, but a little irritated at her obtuseness. Oh, yes, said Judith vaguely. The figure eight, don't you see? He pointed to the balls remaining on the board. Ah, uh, so it is. Where did you learn to do that? She asked, smiling gently. Ah, oh, that's telling, isn't it? He chuckled slyly, swept the balls together with his hand, and announced his intention of going in search of his man with a view to a game of billiards. Judith sank back in her chair as the door closed on him. The firelight played about her face, which, though not less beautiful, had grown to look older. She had been living hard these last few days. The door opened, and Rose came in with her hat on and a parcel in her hand. "'No tea?' she cried, kneeling down on the hearth-rug and holding out her hands to the fire. "'It isn't five o'clock yet.' There was an air of tension, of expectancy almost about Judith, which contrasted markedly with her habitual serenity. Rose turned suddenly. "'When, Judith, when?' she cried with immense archness. "'I don't know,' said Judith quietly. There had been a dance the night before at the Conethals, where Bertie's unconcealed devotion to herself had been one of the events of the hour. "'Judith!' Rose regarded her with excitement. "'Do you mean to say he has spoken? Or are you humbugging in that serious way of yours?' "'Mr. Lee Harrison has not proposed to me, if that is what you want to know.' Rose unfastened her fur mantle in silence. Something in Judith's manner puzzled her. "'He really is a nice little person,' Rose went on, after a pause. "'Such beautiful manners!' Oh, he hands plates and opens doors very prettily. Judith spoke with a certain weary scorn, which Rose accepted as the tone of depreciation natural to a woman who discusses an undeclared admirer. 
As a matter of fact, Judith recognized clearly the marks of breeding, the hundred and one fine differences which distinguished Bertie from the people of her set, whose manners were almost invariably tinged with the respect of persons, that sure foe to respect of humanity. She recognized them and their value as hallmarks wondering all the time with a dreary wonder that any one should attach importance to such things as these. For in her heart she despised the man, his intelligent fluency, his unfailing, monotonous politeness were a weariness to her. His very readiness to fall down utterly before her seemed to her, alas, poor Judith, in itself a brand of inferiority. "'Tea at last!' cried Rose, as the door opened. "'And, Adelaide, what a scent you have for tea, Addie!' Mrs. Montague Cohen swept in past the servant with the tray, and took possession of the best chair. "'Mamma is here, too,' she cried. "'She and Aunt Ada will be in in a minute.' She drew off her gloves, and the two girls rose to greet Mrs. Sachs, who, at this point, came in with Mrs. Lunninger into the room. Judith gave her hand very quietly to Reuben's mother, then took her seat at some distance from the group round the tea-table, occupying herself with cutting the leaves of a novel that had just arrived from Muddy's. "'Reuben is nominated,' cried Adelaide, as she helped herself liberally to tea-cake. "'We had a telegram this morning.' "'He expects to get in this time?' said Mrs. Lunninger, her pessimistic mind reverting naturally to her nephew's first unsuccessful attempt at embarking on a political career. "'It won't be for want of interest if he doesn't,' said Mrs. Sachs. "'Sir Nicholas Chemis and his wife are working day and night for him, day and night. And Mrs. Lee Harrison, Lady Chemis's sister, she seems to be quite specially zealous in the good cause.' put in Adelaide with meaning. Secretly she was mortified at not having been asked down to St. Baldwin's for the campaign, Reuben having met her hints on the subject in a very decided manner. There was some satisfaction in venting her feelings on Judith, for whose benefit her last remark was uttered. "'When is the election?' said Rose, turning to her aunt. "'Not till to-day week.' but I may safely say that there is no real cause for anxiety. "'Did you see last night's globe?' cried Adelaide, and the St. James's. They cracked up Reuben no end. Judith had seen them. She had seen also the Pall Mall Gazette, which expressed itself in very different terms. She had put back poems and ballads on its shelf and had taken to reading all the articles respecting the prospects of the St. Baldwin's elections that she could lay hands on. At least she had a right to be interested in what she had been told so much about, but there were times when she felt, as she read, that her interest was intrusive, a thing to be ashamed of. "'I suppose,' said Rose, "'that he is too busy to write much. We had a letter yesterday, just a line.' He seems in splendid spirits, and has promised to write from time to time," answered Adelaide. "'A good son,' said Mrs. Sachs, half tenderly, half jestingly, very proudly, "'who never forgets his mother.'" So the talk went on. Judith sat there listening, cutting open her novel, and throwing in a remark from time to time. Every word that was uttered seemed a brick in the wall that was building between herself and Reuben. In this crisis of his career, so long looked forward to, so often discussed, he had no need, no thought of her. Adelaide, Esther, Rose, all had more claim on him than she. She was shut out from his life. Reuben, disappointed, defeated. In such a one she would always, in spite of himself, have felt her rights. But Reuben, hopeful, successful, surrounded by admiring friends and relatives, fenced in more closely still by his mother's love, from the contemplation of this glittering figure, cruel, triumphant, she turned away in a stony agony of self-contempt. 
There was a sound of carriage wheels outside, and Lionel, who had been reconnoitering in the hall, burst in with the announcement, "'Grandpa has come!' Mrs. Lunninger received the news with something like agitation. Old Solomon's visits were few and far between, and now as he came, with pompous uncertainty of step across the room, the whole group by the fireside rose hastily and went to meet him. "'Reuben is nominated!' cried Adelaide, when the old man had been established in a chair. "'Yes, yes,' said Solomon Sachs. "'So I hear.' He turned to his niece. "'He ain't looking well, that boy of yours.' Mrs. Sachs shifted uneasily. "'You saw him just before he went, Uncle Solomon, when he was tired out and not himself. He'd been running from pillar to post all the week.' Mrs. Lunninger muttered dejectedly, "'He is getting to look like his father.' Old Solomon raised his square hand to his beard, lifting his eyebrows high above the grave, shrewd, melancholy eyes. Mrs. Sachs started. A sudden look of terror came into her face. The whites of her little hard eyes grew visible. "'Why don't he marry?' said Solomon Sachs, after a pause. "'Why don't he marry that daughter of Cardozo's? She's not much to look at, certainly," he added, and a wave of whimsical amusement broke out suddenly over the large, grave face. Yes, put in Mrs. Lunninger, unusually loquacious. His wife might see that he didn't work himself to death. I don't see how he can work less, cried Adelaide, as he has his way to make, and making your way in these days means pulling a great many strings. Yes, said Mrs. Sachs, relieved by this view of the case. He must get on. Judith began to feel that her powers of endurance had their limits. She rose slowly, went over to the fireplace for a moment, threw a casual remark to Rose, and went from the room. As she made her way upstairs, the postman's knock sounded through the house, and then Lionel came running to her with a letter. Her correspondence was very small and she glanced with but faint interest at the little package in her cousin's hand. He was carrying its seal upwards, and suddenly her heart beat with a wild, mad beating, and the colour leapt to her pale cheeks. She could see that it was sealed with wax. There was only one person that she knew who fastened his letters so. Reuben invariably made the use of the signet ring which had belonged to his father engraved with a crest, duly bought and paid for at the Herald's College. She took the precious thing in her hand, closing her fingers over it, and smiled radiantly at the little boy. "'Thank you, Lionel.' Her room gained, she locked the door, sat down on the bed, and looked at the letter. To Miss Judith Quijano. The writing was certainly not Reuben's, and he never used the two. Then she turned it over and examined the seal, the seal that was totally unfamiliar. She felt a little sick, a little dazed, and leaned her head against the wall. After a time she opened the letter and read it. It was from Bertie Lee Harrison, who asked her to be his wife. It was a long letter, and stated, amongst other things, that he had already obtained his uncle's permission to address her. Old Solomon's words as to his grandson's marriage flashed into her mind. It struck her that these plans for Reuben, for herself, were nothing less than an outrage. It struck her also that she might marry Bertie. All her courage had deserted her, all her daring of thought and feeling, in the face of a world where thought and feeling were kept apart from word and deed. She, too, must fall down and worship at the shrine of that great god, Expediency, for how, otherwise, could she live her life? Thrust out from Reuben's friendship, from all that made her happiness, shorn of self-respect, of respect of her world, how could she bear to go on in the old track? To her blind misery, her ignorance, Bertie was nothing more than a polite little figure holding open for her a door of escape. End of chapter 16